Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here. Another China History Podcast, episode 161 this time. A topic that, if I had a nickel for every time it was requested, it would pay for a couple of nice dinners at my local Denny's. Off the senior menu, of course. Anyone who has listened to these podcasts over the years knows that I hold Joe and Lai in quite high esteem. He has his detractors, though, and we'll look at more than just the myth of Joe and Lai. Was he really as wonderful a man of the people and a leader as the propaganda suggested? Or was he as Rong Zhang and John Holliday described him, quote, a ruthless apparatchik in thrall to his communist faith who served the party with a dauntless lack of personal integrity, end quote. You could be the judge of that. As far as all my Chinese friends, acquaintances, and people I chit-chatted with over the past 30 years, Zhou Zongli has a perfect score. Never once can I ever recall when any friends from China said he was no good for whatever reason. Joe, from the founding of the People's Republic in 1949 until the day he passed away in January of 1976, was always ranked number three in the communist leadership pecking order. It was always Mao first, then whoever was Mao's successor at the time, uh, Liu Shaoqi, Lin Piao, Wang Hongwen, or Hua Guofeng, and then Zhou, always third. Way back when, you may recall, I did that eight-part overview on the life of Deng Xiaoping, CHP 63 to 70. Deng was Zhou Enlai's creation. You could see from very early on how Deng modeled himself on Zhou in many ways. In this series, we'll look at that magnificent story that we've all heard before, how from the time of the May 4th movement and into the 20s, 30s, and 40s, a new China was sculpted out of a nasty century of humiliation. My fellow Americanskis might know of Joe and Lai from The Week That Changed the World, that epical event in February 1972 when Nixon went to China and the door was finally opened. Yeah, Chow Wen Lai, as he used to say on TV. We all know he was China's premier and that he played a major role in foreign relations, or maybe that he was Chairman Mao's right-hand man. Beyond that, not much more. I hope by the time of the final episode, you could have a fuller understanding and appreciation of Zhou Enlai's life. Today, we'll look at his early years, including the role he played in the history of the Communist Party. In the episodes to follow, we'll look at the scope of his responsibilities and the day-to-day running of China, China's foreign relations, and party affairs, too. In today's episode, we'll see early on he had exceptional abilities that weren't hard to notice. He didn't rise through the ranks just on good looks alone. I've said it time and again in that CHP 46 episode and in other episodes that the movement that grew out of the May 4th incident is what did it as far as almost all of China's future leaders were concerned. It was a watershed moment for Zhou Enlai as much as it was for Mao Zedong. May 4th, 1919, it was like a sudden awakening. But before Zhou started walking in that direction, he had a whole upbringing that happened first. The people in his early years made sure he had an education and provided him with a challenging life experience, chock-filled with all kinds of lessons. All these people and circumstances he faced are what shaped him and led him to be the natural choice later on when the party was considering leadership positions in the movement. Three cities get to claim Zhou Enlai as one of their sons. He was born in Huai'an, northern Jiangsu province, a city on the Grand Canal that today is an urban population of two and a half million. The second city is Shaoxing, the place that Zhou considered himself to be a son of. This was where the ancestral Zhou family home was located. The third city to claim Zhou Enlai as one of their own was Tianjin. This was where he was living when the events happened that radicalized Zhou and led him to the path that led to the ultimate founding of the PRC in 1949. He was born March 5, 1898. Same birthday to Song Mei Ling, interestingly enough. I don't know if they ever exchanged birthday cards. Zhou Enlai's paternal grandfather, Zhou Pan Long, was a government official who never rose to the top, but was at least capable enough to rise to the level of a county magistrate in Huai An sometime in the 1870s. Zhou Pan Long's ancestral town was Shaoxing, 
And he was on his deathbed when Joe and Lai was born. The Joe family was one of those that once had it good. But China in the last half of the 19th century couldn't have been more down on its luck. So with the slow demise of the Qing government, so went the fortunes of the Zhou family in Huai'an. Nonetheless, the family compound was still spacious, 90 rooms. Zhou's father, Zhou Yinung, was the second son of Zhou Panlong. He wasn't a bad guy. He just wasn't much of a go-getter, I suppose you could say. He was like a journeyman, working here and working there. One thing's for sure, he wasn't around much when his eldest son, An Lai, was growing up. But that wasn't such a bad thing. If everything grows from the root, you could consider three women to be the ones chiefly responsible for Zhou An Lai turning out to be who he was. One was his mother, Wan Dong Ar. The other was his adoptive mother, who we know as Lady Chen. And last, there was his wet nurse, who we know as Jiang. Each one played their critical role in Zhou's earliest days with his education, teaching traditional Confucian values, and all aspects of Chinese culture. His wet nurse, Jiang, often took young Zhou and Lai to the other side of the railroad tracks where she lived. Like Caesar, who grew up in the Sabura, Zhou, the relatively high-born, got an early taste of mixing with the masses and learn to be and feel comfortable with them. The Joes may have fallen on hard times, but they were still a distinguished and respected family. A family in their social circumstances normally would not mix with these less privileged elements of society. When young Zhou Enlai was barely four months old, he was given to the family of Zhou Yinung's youngest brother, Zhou Yigan. This was Zhou Enlai's Shu Shu. This dying uncle, racked with tuberculosis, seemed destined to die without a son and heir. And this ultimately meant that he had no one to perform the ancestral rites for him. But older brother Zhou Yinung, without a second thought, allowed his only son to be adopted by this childless Didi, Zhou Yigan and his wife, Lady Chen. Zhou Yinung was still healthy and theoretically had plenty of years left to produce more sons. Later on, indeed, in 1899, Zhou Yigan died, and from that point on, his widow, Lady Chen, took a heavy hand in Zhou Enlai's upbringing and education. They all lived in the same family compound, and Zhou had his adoptive and natural mother with him throughout these early childhood years. So the two women exchanged traditional and legal roles, whereby... Lady Chun acted as his Mu Qin, or mother, and his natural mother, Wan Dong Er, was relegated to Gan Ma, or adoptive mother status. Wan Dong Er's father was a scholar official, and her mother came from peasant stock. Zhou would sometimes make hay about his, <laughs> air quotes, peasant background, thanks to his mother, but for all intents and purposes, he grew up in a family of scholar officials serving the Qing government. In 1904, Zhou's father received a job posting elsewhere, and for a while the Zhou family moved in with Wan Dong Er's father, Zhou Enlai's Wai Gong. This was a nice, traditional Chinese scholar's home filled with books and all the classics that had been passed down since the time of the 100 schools. Young Zhou Enlai studied at the Wan family school and began his education. All the great novels of the Ming and Qing, he consumed those too. Zhou, the witty, intellectual, and aspiring writer and great communicator, probably grew out of this short stay at his Wai Gong's. But the good times were not to last. In 1907, his mother died of esophageal cancer. And the following summer, in 1908, his adoptive mother, Lady Chen, also passed away suddenly. To pay for his mother's funeral, the Zhou family had to liquidate a lot of their possessions. It didn't bring ruination upon them, but when Lady Chun passed so suddenly in the wake of Wan Dong Er, that broke the bank, and there were hardly enough baubles and family heirlooms to cover the cost. Of course, there was never any thought about whether or not funds should be allocated for a proper funeral. It was done according to the custom, and if it bankrupted the family, that's the way it was back then. You had to do what you had to do. In 1908, Zhou Enlai, all of 10 years old, was now in charge of his family. There was no time to waste being a kid. Joe had mouths to feed and a family to maintain. He grew up fast. His nurse, Jiang, stuck with the family. They couldn't pay her anything, but her sense of duty to young Joe and Lai and to the family knew no bounds. 
Let me quote from something Zhou once said. Uh, I'm quoting Han Su Yin's book, Eldest Son, Zhou Enlai and the Making of Modern China. He once said, quote, My own mother was gentle and tender, but she was not well educated, for the Wan family did not believe in education for women. But from her I learned kindness, forbearance. I have some of her character. Ambition has been left out of me. My adoptive mother was well educated. Her parents were enlightened. She taught me to love knowledge and to use my mind. My nurse took me to her home by the Grand Canal, and from her I learned how the working people lived. She taught me unselfishness. End quote. Eleven, twelve years old, the equivalent of an American fifth, sixth grader, young Zhou Enlai was hustling, trying to make ends meet at a time when the Qing dynasty was just about, but not quite, ready to topple. After turning the corner at the second half of Qianlong's long reign, the slow, steady decline in the Manchu Qing dynasty's fortunes had finally come down to this. It wasn't what you'd call a stable time in China. But this was the world Zhou Enlai was operating in, a youngster still wearing a queue, taking care of his family. In the spring of 1910, Zhou was sent north to Shenyang for a short stretch where he was taken in by Zhou Yinang's eldest brother, Zhou Yiqian. This would be his bo fu. Here, Zhou had his first taste of formal schooling. But this bo fu, Zhou Yiqian, suddenly received a posting for a position in Shanghai. So young Zhou Enlai was again passed off to yet another brother of Zhou Yinang. This brother, Zhou Yigang, he was important. And it's nothing that he did. He and his wife were childless and were willing to take on the responsibilities of their nephew. They too lived in Shenyang, but later Zhou Yigang got posted to Tianjin. And there in Tianjin, Zhou Enlai took his first step on a path he never wavered from till the end of his days. The long and winding path that would lead Zhou to Mao Zedong started in Tianjin. So much happened in Tianjin. First of all, it was a treaty port and one of the most cosmopolitan and modern cities in China. Here, Zhou received his first exposure to Western education and writings. In Tianjin, he also first came across the works of Zhou Rong and Zhou's 1903 work, Ge Mingjun, or Revolutionary Army. And like millions of other young Chinese, he also read Kan Yo Wei and Liang Qi Chao. With the recent demise of the Qing dynasty, there was a kind of euphoria in the air about where China might go from here. In September 1913, Zhou Yigang was able to get his nephew An Lai placed into the recently established Nankai Middle School. This school was established by a very innovative educator of his day, Yan Xiu. Yan had been a major proponent of the new learning and was all for chucking the old traditional education system and adopting one that was more modern and relevant. Nankai Middle School was a very unique and groundbreaking school in its day. Zhang Boling served as the president of Nankai. He was another major innovator in his day and a pioneer in education. It might come as no surprise that both Yan Xiu and Zhang Boling both noticed young Zhou Enlai, and you could say they took him under their wing. They knew his family was struggling, and so they facilitated Zhou's entry into Nankai. And Zhou got involved in sports and many other extracurricular activities, and one that he particularly had a passion for was writing and publishing. As Zhou began to blossom at Nankai Middle School, the European mainland was raging with the bloodiest, goriest military conflict in its history. Intellectuals and other literate people in China were consuming these magazines, newsletters, and pamphlets that were available everywhere and inspired people to rise up and be counted. Zhou's first entree into this world was a journal he ran from October 1914 to June 1917 called Jingye, or Respect Work. He also got involved in and worked his way to the top of the school's official weekly journal called Xiaofeng, or School Wind. Nankai Middle School was proving to be an excellent incubator for teenage Zhou Enlai. Under the mentorship of Yan Xiu and Chang Boling, Zhou had emerged as someone so obviously brimming with potential. And another thing, if you look at all the early photos of Zhou Enlai in his teens, he was a Hollywood heartthrob. 
to have those looks coupled with the charisma he oozed and a mind that almost had no limits. It was only natural that he would be selected to speak at his class's graduation ceremony in 1917. After Nankai, the next stop for Zhou Enlai was Japan. You remember from past CHP episodes, going to Japan to study was something a lot of Chinese did during the World War I years. Joe, like so many others, decided to go to Japan and to try and soak up whatever he could that Japan had to offer in the way of new ideas that were suitable for China. If Japan was a possible model for China's future political system, he wanted to see for himself. They obviously knew something China didn't. So in July 1917, after first stopping off in Shenyang, Zhou Enlai headed out to Japan. These turned out to be two rough years. A lot was happening in Zhou Enlai's life to distract him during this period. He was constantly broke, always living off of the kindness of others. No matter how hard he tried, he just couldn't pick up Japanese, nor was he thriving in the Japanese educational system. Exam after exam ended in failure. All the while, he agonized over his family's plight back in China. He knew they were struggling, and there wasn't anything he could do about it. One of his uncles died while he was in Japan. He had also discovered the pleasures of sake and tended to overdo it. It was not a good time. But like a lot of his fellow Chinese students trying to get by in Japan, he agonized about the homeland and what he could do about it. Whilst in Japan, Joe discovered Chen Du Xiu's new youth magazine, Xin Qing Nian. Chen's writing affected Joe like it affected everyone who read it. The October Revolution had just gone down in Russia. Suddenly, all this talk, literature, and ideas began to be passed about, and the impact it had on radicalization was profound. It was all over Japan, and Joe got his first whiff. Actually, he had run across New Youth magazine during his Nankai middle school days, but it didn't hit him like it did now during his Japan years. During the period of this Japan stay, everything became crystal clear to Zhou Enlai as far as the path China needed to take to revive itself. It wasn't the Japanese model. He saw what everyone else saw, an expansionist Japan, no better or no worse than the other imperialist nations, all grabbing for their own piece of China to hold on to and exploit. On May 5, 1919, Zhou Enlai left Japan, carrying all this experience back to China. May 4th, had just happened. Giddy on Marxist ideology, Joe enrolled at Nankai University. Academic affairs played a major backseat to Joe's new passion, organizing and interacting with other like-minded students with passions similarly inflamed from the impact of May 4th. The student newspaper was called the Tianjin Student Union, the Tianjin Xuesheng Lianhe Hui Bao. This was Joe's outlet to express himself. This was no small fly-by-night publication. It had a circulation of more than 20,000 readers, including student leaders from all over China. Fresh with the experience of his time in Japan and the fire that ignited so many passions on May 4th, Joe plunged deep into the pool of student activism. So big of a splash did this student paper cause, it ended up getting shut down by the authorities on August 22nd, 1919. A few weeks later... Zhou, along with 20 other student leaders, established the Jie Wu Shi, or Awakening Society. Other students from the Tianjin Patriotic Association of Women joined as well, the youngest among them, little Deng Ying Chao, all of 16 years old and already a hellraiser. She was something else. Deng Ying Chao had been reading Zhou Enlai's work since she was 13 years old. After her father died when she was just a kid, growing up in Guangxi, the father's family wouldn't have anything to do with her or her mother. Like Zhou Enlai, Deng Yingchao chanced to have an amazing mother. And her mother, Yang Chen, molded little Yingchao into what she became. Educated, fearless, independent, and tough. Another noted member was Liu Qingyang. She was dating a fellow Nankai University student named Zhang Shenfu. 
Liu was a friend of Li Ta Chao. You remember that name, of course. He was the librarian at Peking University who later on, with Chen Du Xiu, co-founded the Chinese Communist Party. Li Ta Chao's assistant at the library, you remember, was a guy named Mao Zedong. Later on, Liu Qingyang and Zhang Shanfu end up playing a rather important role in Zhou's story. Zhou Enlai was instantly recognizable as a standout. He was offered the chairmanship of the Awakening Society, but like he usually did, he passed on the top spot and preferred to work behind the scenes, facilitating everything. Right when the Awakening Society was established, Li Da Chao came to Tianjin and spoke to them about Marxism and Bolshevism. And while Zhou Enlai was feasting on the buffet of possibilities that this ideology offered, Japan was really acting aggressively in China like never before. Emboldened by their gains from Germany's losses in Shandong, Japan began eyeing the riches of Manchuria, North China. Protests and demonstrations were happening with greater frequency than ever before. And this, of course, made the establishment quite alarmed, and as this student and worker radicalism began to rise, so did government pushback. The capitalist class wanted to see anything except all this talk of better conditions for the oppressed classes. The talk produced at these protests ran counter to what the government, the warlords, the Japanese, and other foreigners were counting on. Crackdowns ensued, and a lot of these student leaders wound up in prison. A high-profile rabble-rouser like Zhou Enlai was quickly caught in the net, and it was only a matter of time before Zhou would get arrested. January 29, 1920, sure enough, he leads a protest to the governor's office, and the next thing you know, he gets thrown in the slammer for six months. He wasn't wearing a ball and chain or breaking rocks, but he did serve his time along with many other like-minded individuals, and there were no doubt endless hours spent reading, exchanging ideas, and debating the issues. He made the best of his incarceration, and when he walked out of there, Zhou Enlai's street cred and share price received a nice shot of adrenaline. Joe picked up right where he left off. 1920, he headed up to Beijing and met with Li Ta Chao and worked together with other student leaders. Together with these like-minded students, Joe formed a kind of federation that helped to promote the more efficient exchanging of ideas and information about reform amongst all the students across China. Like Yan Xiu and Zhang Boling at Nankai, Li Da Zhao also saw something unique and special in Zhou Enlai and took an interest in him. He recognized Zhou's incredible organizing skills and how he was so smooth in the manner he conducted himself. Yan Xiu, in cooperation with the Sino French Educational Commission, established this fund that allowed Chinese students to go to France and study things like. Western government, science, and politics. Joe was one of the students given a chance and received a monthly stipend to cover all his basic expenses. In addition to this, Joe also made a little extra rice, agreeing to serve as a foreign correspondent in Paris for a local Tianjin daily. Unlike Deng Xiaoping, who we recall was on a work-study program that ended up being high on work and low on study, Joe had his way paid he didn't have to deal with the whole nine-to-five thing. Without the need to always hustle for his next meal, Joe was able to focus more intently on activities of a more revolutionary nature. He sailed on the French vessel Porthos on November 7th, 1920, arriving in Marseille December 13th. He didn't stay long in France. Joe made his way to London, arriving January 5th, 1921. After a five-week stint... He found London town a little pricey, so he headed back to France. In France, Joe got to learn about and better understand what communism was. He was already quite certain this was the answer for China. Do you remember Liu Qingyang and Zhang Shenfu? They too came to France in early 1921. Zhang was a lecturer at Peking University and was already a committed communist. His wife, Liu Qingyang, was offered a position to teach in Lyon at a Sino-French university there. Both of them were instructed by Chen Duxiu himself to establish a Chinese Communist Party cell in Paris. This was the other reason they were there. And in May 1921, Zhang and Liu reeled in quite a nice-sized fish when they sponsored Zhou Enlai's membership. 
to the Chinese Communist Party. And if they never did another thing again to be able to say, oh, I recruited Zhou Enlai into the party, was quite an achievement. He was admitted the following summer. Zhou's work and effectiveness as an organizer and publisher put a lot of shine on him. His reputation as someone who got things done became well known around town. So organized and vociferous were these radicalized students becoming that the French authorities began to feel a bit uneasy. And when the police moved in and started arresting as many of these Chinese radicals as they could catch, they were all taken to Marseille and kicked out of France. Joe was not among those. He laid low and continued on secretly with his agitating, organizing, and recruiting. It was all great practice for what lay ahead. The Communist Party of China, we all remember from CHP episodes 48 and 61, was founded July 1, 1921 in Shanghai. Zhou Enlai, along with 22 other comrades, formed the Chinese Youth Communist Party in Europe. It was considered a branch of the CCP. Zhou, as the case always will be, doesn't head the organization, but serves as director of propaganda instead. He had spent the winter of 1921-1922 in Berlin, coordinating activities out there and setting up communist cells in Germany and Belgium. The following year, February 1923, the name of the organization was changed to the Chinese Communist Youth League in Europe. They were directly under the Chinese Socialist Youth League, established in China, May 1922. Joe was made general secretary, which put him in charge of recruiting, organizing, and coordinating all activities. In other words, he had to do almost everything. They couldn't have picked a more suitable person to fill those shoes. At the third party congress in June 1923, the CCP decided that they would obey the orders from their common turn masters and fully cooperate with the KMT, the Kuomintang, to join together in a united front to rid China of these parasitic and destructive warlords. And in this new dynamic, Zhou Enlai, already well-known and respected as a major guy in the European communist movement, began to work directly with none other a personage than Sun Yat-sen himself. In November 1923, Sun sent one of his people to Lyon to set up a KMT branch there. They were met by Zhou Enlai, who worked with this representative to get the Paris liaison office of the KMT set up and operational. Joe was made the director of the general office. Also part of this new organization were Li Fu Chun and Nie Rong Jun, two comrades who, like Joe, would go on to carve out a name for themselves in PRC history. In fact, the previous October, Joe had already sponsored Zhu De's membership into the party. And then came the next milestone in Zhou Enlai's life. He met Deng Xiaoping. You can see how during these years, 1921, 22, 23, many of these giants of early PRC history are slowly, slowly beginning to coalesce. In Europe, they are organized around Zhou. In China as well, it is all coming together in a slow but steady way. Joe was the natural choice to be put in charge of the party journal, Red Light, or Chi Guang. This was an important publication in the movement, and all the top eyes in both the party in China and Russia read it. Under Joe, it became a leading United Front publication. And in France, Joe worked side by side with 19-year-old Deng Xiaoping, who famously operated the mimeograph machine. The joe Deng relationship lasted more than four decades, and it all began here. We all know this isn't going to last, but at least for a little while, the emerging CCP will join together with the ruling KMT in a united front. These were uneasy bed partners from the very start, but they didn't know back then what we all know now. On the strength of the face of Sun Yat-sen and Russian funding and support, Everyone in the struggling Republic of China went along with this. So enthusiastically did Joe throw himself into his work, helping the KMT to get all set up in Europe. In no time at all, he was already a major somebody in the eyes of the KMT. So effective is his work carrying out KMT directives for Europe, Joe is called back to China to essentially do the same thing in China that he did in Europe. 
both the communists and the KMT flew the banner of defeating the warlords. But that one thing aside, from the very genesis of the United Front, CCP and KMT leaders knew this was a shotgun marriage and they better watch their backs and keep their eyes and ears open. In the face of so much pressure from French police, things began to wind down for all these remaining Chinese students there. In groups and singly, they all began to leave. Some, like Joe, went straight back to China. Others went back via Russia, where they lingered a while and basked in the glory of the new socialist paradise. As a group, these Chinese comrades became known as the French Returnees. Zhou Enlai was the most prominent to this group. After three years and eight months in Europe, Zhou, along with other future CCP luminaries, arrived back in China via Hong Kong on September 1st, 1924. As the one chiefly responsible for building up the CCP in Europe, he left quite an achievement. By this time, Zhou had managed to compile one hell of a Rolodex. Many of these names would go on to serve in the Politburo and Standing Committee. Joe's time in France provided him with excellent training in how to evade the authorities. Pretty much from this point forward, on and off, until 1949, Joe Enlai was a most wanted man. As we'll see, there are times, like now, in his capacity as part of the United Front, where Joe operated openly. In France, right under the noses of the police who watched the every move of these radical Chinese students and workers, Joe organized and led all kinds of activities. Joe would have more than his share of close calls, but try as they might, the KMT secret police had one heck of a time trying to catch Joe on lie cheating. The important thing to remember during this United Front period, 1923 to 1927, was that it was a game... Stalin played as he bided his time trying to figure out which horse to bet on. Remember, China and Russia share a 2,600-mile-long non-contiguous border. If he thought having China as a neighbor wasn't such a good thing, he wanted to make sure he had the lesser of two evils across the border. Sun Yat-sen's KMT was struggling, and the West wasn't being terribly enthusiastic or generous with political and military support. This opened the door for the Soviet Union. Sun Yat-sen held his nose and cozied up with Russia. Stalin had what he wanted. Now he could manipulate the KMT while he bided his time to see if the CCP was worth placing his chips on. Ever since June of 1920, the way in which Russia kept an eye on overseas communist organizations was through the Comintern, the Communist International. Some of these common turn agents were good, some were not so good. They were sent to China to show everyone how the whole communist thing worked. They also provided funding for all activities. And whatever they told these CCP members to do, they had to do it. One of the orders was to join the KMT. They didn't have to give up their CCP membership. They could be sort of like a dual resident. They joined the KMT as individual members, and in the spirit of the United Front, they all pretended to read from one single hymnal. That was hard enough to do while Sun Yat-sen was alive, but the Guo Fu leaves his earthly form in May 1925, so early in the movie. Now Sun Yat-sen, the glue who held everything together, was gone. This is where things start to get a little dicey. The CCP knew they had a good thing. Compared to the organization and apparatus of the KMT, they were still wearing diapers. They had a lot to learn and needed time to grow. If the KMT was open to act as a willing host, they had no problem being the virus and using this state of affairs to spread. Joe and Lai, with all his street cred and glowing CV, openly wore two hats. First, he was secretary of the Chinese Communist Party of Guangdong and Guangxi. This isn't the party center, but it's still a big posting. At the same time, he was made the political director of the first army of the newly created and Soviet-funded Wampoa Military Academy. The blokes who actually ran things were the agents from the Comintern. 
Russia wasn't about to hand some blank check to China. Everything went through these guys. And if they ordered the KMT to play nice with the communists, the KMT had to listen. Joe held the rank of major general and was perfectly positioned inside the operation to carefully grow and nurture the CCP. Joe, as well as Ye Jianying, got to lead troops into battle in what was known as the Eastern Campaign against the warlord and former Sun ally and later nemesis Chen Jiongming. This campaign against this warlord in February and March 1925 was a total defeat for Chen, and he ended up fleeing to Hong Kong, where he railed against Sun and later against Jiang. When Chen Jiongming was out of the way, all of Guangdong fell under nationalist control. We don't usually equate Zhou Enlai with military affairs, but during this period, for about a decade, between 1925 and 1935, Zhou was hands-on as far as his involvement in military planning and execution. This Eastern campaign was a great training session for Zhou and taught him quite a bit about military planning and operation. Even Jiang Kai-shek rewarded Zhou for his role in the defeat of Chen Chongming's army. After this... Zhou was made a special commander of the Shantou region. In early 1925, the Communist Party of China had a total membership of less than 1,000. Two years later, membership hovered near 58,000. The Communists received a shot in the arm from the May 30th movement, 1925. I'm sure you remember from past episodes, British soldiers killed 56 protesting workers in Xiamen, Guangzhou, and then another 12 in Shanghai. And this led to a general strike that lasted for 18 months and brought international commerce to its knees, not only in Shanghai, but Guangzhou and Hong Kong as well. Around this time, this Guangzhou period of Zhou Enlai's life, he first met Mao. Mao was also establishing a name for himself as an up-and-coming leader in Hunan. He was a little bit too radical for the leadership and enjoyed nowhere near the prestige that Zhou had. Zhou also met with an old colleague from his days in France. This was Ho Chi Minh. Zhou Enlai and Ho Chi Minh worked very closely in the early communist movement in Vietnam. Also at the Fourth Party Congress held in Shanghai in January 1925, Zhou requested permission and was approved by the party center to marry Deng Yingchao. She thereupon sailed down to Guangzhou from Tianjin and arrived in July of that year. No one met her at the dock. She had an address written down and where to go, and off she went. And they were married on August 8, 1925 in Guangzhou. There was a wedding party held at the Taiping Guan in Guangzhou on Beijing Lu. I went there a couple trips ago just to experience. Back in its heyday, it was one of the first, if not the first, Chinese-managed restaurants serving Western food. It was considered sort of a novelty to the Chinese. In any case, it's still around, and I had a lousy meal there, but was nonetheless conscious the whole time of sharing this space with Zhou Enlai albeit nine decades later. As smooth and low-key as Zhou Enlai was in his recruiting activities and in building up the Communist Party in Guangzhou, the KMT leaders knew full well what he was up to. They just couldn't catch him. But in March 1926, right-wing elements in the KMT put their heads together and were determined to find an excuse to push back against the growing strength and potential political power the CCP was building. Not only did they want to crack down on the communists, they were tired of the common turn, always making monkeys out of them. They wanted to terminate that business relationship. Chiang Kai-shek was the main person in charge at the Wampoa Military Academy. He saw how the army was being openly and secretly infiltrated with communists and left-leaning elements. Chiang began to try and smoke out Zhou Enlai. He did this first by putting Zhou on the spot and requested him to provide a list of all CCP members in the First Army and those enrolled at the academy. January 1926, Zhou Enlai's secretary was arrested for getting caught passing secret messages to the party center in Shanghai. Whenever something like this went down, Jiang became more and more aggressive in the manner he would protest to Zhou and accuse him of faking support for the United Front. In March of 1926, the Zhongshan gunboat incident went down. 
This was a boat with a mostly communist crew that for some reason, maybe they were given orders specifically to provoke an incident, you know, whatever the case, this gunboat sailed from Wampoa downriver to Guangzhou. Jiang claimed no knowledge of this order and accused Zhou of trying to make some kind of power play. And this gave Jiang the perfect pretext to come down hard. The commander of the gunboat was immediately arrested. The First Army headquarters was raided, as was the Wampoa Military Academy. There was a massive roundup of all communists. Nye Rongzhen was one of the fish caught in that particular net. Jiang promptly declared martial law and had all pro-communist elements booted out of the KMT. 250 communists were thrown out of the Wampoa Military Academy. Zhou Enlai had just returned from Shanto when all this went down. He was arrested at first, but released. He went straight to see Jiang Kai-shek to ask, what the hell, man? But Jiang turned the tables and started pointing fingers at Zhou, accusing him of causing all this and dealing in bad faith. And this was the strategy Jiang adopted. To claim that he was the victim, he cried to the Soviets and said that it was only he who was following the rules and Zhou was double-dealing and all this was his fault. Jiang, despite a growing dislike for the Soviets that bordered on hatred, knew he couldn't blow them off just yet. The nationalists were still dependent on all this Soviet financial and military support. Jiang's dilemma was how to get rid of the communists but keep the Soviet aid. Stalin was having a good time playing everyone for fools. Careful not to push Jiang too far, he made everyone apologize to the Generalissimo. Even Chen Duxiu expressed his regrets to Jiang. On April 11th, feeling confident at the turn of events, Jiang dismissed Zhou as director of the political department of the academy and as head of the Shanto Regional Committee. So the Zhongshan gunboat incident pretty much gave Jiang almost everything he hoped for. The communists were back on their heels in 1926, and Zhou's role had been diminished. We're going to pick up next time in the summer of 1926 with the launch of the Northern Expedition. Zhou's role in the party will continue to become more and more critical to the survival of the CCP, especially during its darkest hour. We'll save all that for next episode. Zhou Enlai and the whole... CCP apparatus still have a hard way to go before they arrive in the promised land. In this episode, I wanted to just trace the steps that molded Zhou Enlai's character and turned him into this ultimate political operative. Though nowhere near facing the life of a hard scrabble peasant, he nonetheless ate quite a lot of bitterness growing up in his particular circumstances. But along each step of the way, Zhou Enlai had relatives and mentors who recognized something special in him and all went out of their way to lend support at critical times. His time spent at Nankai Middle School and University was a turning point in his life. By this time, he pretty much knew what he wanted to be when he grew up. Nankai led to Japan, which led him back to China. May 4th happened. He does his six-month stretch in prison, then began his French period in Europe, Zhou Enlai was able to spread his wings, and everyone who knew him or knew of him were blown away at his organizational and recruiting skills and his political savvy and savoir-faire in almost any situation. We made it up to 1926. It's been a year since Sun Yat-sen tragically passed away at a time when China never needed him more. The entire United Front has turned into this Cantonese opera. With the Zhongshan gunboat incident... Chiang Kai-shek is starting to feel around the edges to see where the weaknesses were that he could exploit. Jiang knew exactly what Zhou Enlai was up to. Because 28-year-old Zhou was by 1926 such a high-profile political figure, the common turn demanded special handling in his case, so Jiang couldn't do what he probably wished he could do, which was have Zhou rubbed out. But CKS did file that thought away. And that's all for next time. No kidding, I was sure I was going to get as far as the Zunyi Conference in this episode. Maybe I better pick up the pace a little. Almost 50 minutes, I'd say we are 
well into stoppage time, so let's just pull the plug right here. I know you're all secretly hoping the CHP is going to follow up the historic tease of China with something else, perhaps suitable for the upcoming holiday season. Your wish may come true. Details forthcoming. Once again, the ChinaMoneyNetwork.com hosts Nina Xiang's internationally renowned China Money podcast, where you can get the skinny on everything that's going on in China finance and investment. They're in iTunes and all the major podcast aggregators. Great Seneca a couple weeks ago. Rana Mitter. Wow. I listened to that one in my palatial suite at the Encore in Vegas. I was in town for the Money 2020 show, had some downtime, ordered a nice expensive room service, and sat back and enjoyed that episode over a fine glass of Avion. Seneca always was and always will be one of my faves. And may I personally recommend once again the anthill.org for all lovers of fine fiction and nonfiction works. Alec Ash, Tom Pellman, and some of the most talented writers in China. Be looking in November for the definitive anthology of the best to come out of that superb writer's colony, the finest in China, if you'd like my absolutely worthless opinion, theanthill.org. More Joe and Lai next time, and at the rate we're going, probably for the next several episodes after that as well. This is Laszlo Montgomery bidding you a fond farewell from a bone-dry Los Angeles, California. Come on, Texas, share some of that rain with us, would you? May you find it in your hearts to join me next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.